Godhead already contains the concept of fullness. But this word is added to make sure we understand. If you could think the Godhead could be divided, if you could think the Godhead could be diminished, well then, stop that thinking because he is the fullness of the Godhead. There it makes it clear. He's not a lesser deity. He's not an emanation from God or a part of God or an agent of God or a junior God. He is the fullness of God. Now, in case that's not enough, there is another word, all. Now, the word fullness includes the word all. If the glass is full, you cannot add anything more to it. But in him dwells all the fullness. Just to emphasize the point, the scripture is using three words where just one would be enough. It's kind of like hammering a nail. In him dwells all, boom. The fullness, boom, of the Godhead, boom. Just hitting it one more time to make sure it gets in there and stays in there and doesn't come out to un so that we will understand that Jesus is the revelation of all the fullness of the Godhead. That means everything that God is, Jesus is. Any name or title that we can apply to God, we can apply to Jesus. If God is the Savior, Jesus is the Savior. If God is the healer, Jesus is the healer. Whatever God is, Jesus is. And in fact, you can go through the Old Testament and you find all the titles of God and you can find that they're all given to Jesus in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God is the first and the last. In the New Testament, Jesus is the first and the last. The Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament, Jesus is the good shepherd. In the Old Testament, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In the New Testament, Jesus is the light of the world, and Jesus is the Savior. In the Old Testament, Jehovah is all of these things, the rock, uh, the, the uh, king, um, and on and on we could go. But in the New Testament, Jesus is all of these things. And so it is right to say that Jesus is the Son of God. It is also right to say Jesus is God. Both titles are very valuable, very important. Now let's talk about Son of God a little bit more. I already mentioned to you from Luke chapter 135 that this refers to God as He is manifested in the flesh. The Bible does not use the term Son for eternal deity. But it always uses the term son for the incarnation. The Bible never says God the son. It always says the son of God. The Bible never says eternal son. It says the only begotten son. The son had a beginning. Now the spirit of Jesus did not have a beginning. But the son, referring to the incarnation, had a beginning. You can see this in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, Galatians 4, 4, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. God is eternal, but the Son was made of a woman, made under the law. Son had a beginning at a certain point in time. All right. So when we say <clears throat> that Jesus is the Son of God, we mean He is begotten by God's Spirit. We're talking about Him being born according to the flesh. Now, when we say the Son, it does not mean the flesh only, but it means God manifests in the flesh. Now, sometimes it's referring to something that only the flesh can do. As, for example, it says the death of His Son. Obviously, only a human can die. Spirit cannot die. So when the Bible speaks of the death of the Son, that's a very obvious example. It's referring to the flesh. But Jesus said, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Uh, the Son of Man will come. You'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. Does that mean be just, just the flesh? No. It means God as He is manifested in the flesh. So the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Who was forgiving sins? Jesus standing there before them visibly, physically. He had the power of God, therefore he was able to forgive sins. 
but he wasn't forgiving sins just as a spirit. He was forgiving sins in the flesh before them. When Jesus comes back in the clouds, it won't be just as a man. It will be as with the power of God. But yet, it won't be an invisible spirit. It will be the visible body of Jesus. So the term son is not limited to flesh. The term son refers to the one person of Jesus who is both God and man at the same time. But what I'm saying is the term son always includes the flesh. In other words, it always refers to the incarnation. It cannot speak just of spirit only, but only the spirit as incarnated in flesh. And that's the scriptural use of the term son. So when we confess Jesus is the son of God, that's very important because we're confessing he's a true man who died for our sins. And without Je Jesus being a true man, we have no salvation. So we should proclaim and preach that Jesus is the son of God. That's a very beautiful oneness truth that Jesus is the son of God. In fact, one of the oneness pioneers, Bishop G.T. Haywood, uh, I don't know if you know or sing the song, but he wrote a beautiful song, Jesus, the Son of God. Oh, sweet wonder. Oh, sweet wonder. Jesus, the Son of God. And that should be a very precious truth. At the same time, we understand, and it's right to say, Jesus is God. Because the Bible does say that as well. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Go back to the prophecies of the Old Testament. We find Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, a prophecy of the birth of Christ. It says that a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. And you know what Emmanuel means? God with us. And you can read it in, in uh, Matthew 1, 23. It gives the translation. God with us. So the Son is more than a Son. The Son is also God with us. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Notice, Isaiah 9, 6, the child is more than a child. He's also the Mighty God. The Son is more than a Son. He's also the Everlasting Father. So, Jesus is not only Son of God, but He is God. John chapter 20 is one of the most powerful statements of this. After the resurrection of Jesus, perhaps you remember the story, he appeared to his disciples and Thomas was not present, so Thomas didn't believe. He said, I won't believe unless I see him for myself and see the nail prints in his hand, touch them. So then Jesus appeared again to his disciples and this time Thomas was present. Jesus said, all right, Thomas. Come touch me. See for yourself. Well, of course, Thomas recognized Jesus. And so he fell down and made this confession in John chapter 20, verse 20. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now here's a direct statement that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. I've heard many people try to explain this away, but there's no good explanation. I've had some say, oh, Thomas was just making an expression of surprise. My God. <laughs> but that would be taking God's name in vain. I hope none of you do that. He, he wouldn't do that. And I've heard some say, oh, he was looking at Jesus. He said, my Lord. And he looked up to heaven, my God. Obviously, they're trying to avoid the meaning of the scripture here. But Jesus was making this confession looking at Jesus. Thomas was making this confession looking at Jesus. And remember, Thomas was trained as a Jew from childhood. There's only one God. There's only one Lord. 
He's the 